Hey everyone, this is S M Pratt, and it's time for the 5K Q&A responses. As usual, we have about 100 questions to get through. I'm going in blind on this one. I just grabbed the comments, printed them out, so we're going to get right into it, starting with R1B. They asked, do you think current sets will ever be as valuable as Watsi, and how long will it take? In general, no. More specifically, no. I don't think this is going to happen for a number of reasons. The easiest way to describe it is, Base Unlimited is about 20 years old. And it's literally base set and it's still affordable today. So majority of these modern sets are printed in the similar quantity to base set, but they aren't base set. So therefore, I wouldn't hold your breath. That's just my general overview for modern versus vintage. Next question. If you were a kid today, what would you collect other than Pokemon? That's actually a really good question. I think DB Super comes to mind. I watched Dragon Ball Z growing up. I actually had some of the cards and, and figures as well. And I'd imagine I had, you know, have the same experience now with Dragon Ball Super watching the show and wanting to get, you know, a picture of Goku or whatever on the card, especially with those cards today. They have like the nice full art chase cards similar to Pokemon. So yeah, I think DB Super would be my answer. Turtle Todd says, hey, S.M. Pratt, from my knowledge, sets are printed for two years. Burning Shadows came out in August 2017, looking in particular at Rainbow Charizard, is it better to buy this while the set is still being printed based on your previous experience? Would you expect the price for one to rise sharply when the set has stopped being purchased? This is kind of flirting a little bit with Patreon territory, but my general impression of Hyper Rare Charizard and what you're asking is if you compare the pop of Hyper Rare Charizard to Gold Star Charizard. Like you said, Hyper Rare Charizard has been out since August 2017 and is about the same amount graded as Gold Star Charizard from 2006. So that's my general impression. More specifically, I do think Hyper Rare Charizard is going to act differently than like your Shaman EX. I don't see it being a Shaman EX where it's going to be something that is way up there because it's playable and then goes down to like $10. I highly doubt that would happen with Hyper Rare Charizard because it is genuinely difficult to pull. And even if it would drop like 100% or whatever, you'd have people like me coming in and buying them because I know they're actually difficult to find within the context of modern. So I do see it acting differently. Does that mean it's going to grow much, if at all? Not sure, but I don't see that pitfall happening with Shaman because it's not based on playability. It's based on collectability. Christian Stark asks, what in your opinion will be the best challenge this hobby, the biggest challenge this hobby faces moving forward over the next five years? That's a really good question. I think... Probably a mixture of fake cards and the nonsense you see on like social media with, you know, raffles. There's not mini raffles, which are basically just scams uh, that those are literally illegal in most states. So I think though anything like that, anytime there's growth, there's going to naturally be a, a growth in the shadow as well. If you think like a physical object grows, it's going to have a larger shadow. So those are probably the issues moving forward. I don't know how much, as long as you have a core of experts out there, this is why you need expertise in a hobby. Uh, because it's something you simply can't teach. You know, I could say all this to someone, but it won't stick, kind of like a language. Sure, you could teach Spanish, you know, French, English, whatever it is, but there's a difference to that immersion. There's a difference of it being second nature. So as long as you have that core of experts, I'm not too worried. Jason, you asked, how likely is it that we'll face the mass production attempts of high quality fakes, not the BS custom cards, not low level Chinese Pokemon Go card game knockoffs, but high quality fakes, or even some that have been in the TCG we might miss? Uh, that's, again, very good question. I can't say because that's not a reality. Ideally, I hope it isn't a reality, but if we look at something like sports, where it's a little bit older, there are some high-end fakes, even some with the same card stock, like this correct to the era. But again, you need that core of experts. As long as you have the core of experts, we'll be able to navigate those waters, but they are the emerging thing. You know, they're the emerging thing to keep an eye on. Itchy Blastoise asks, as packs become more scarce, will we see prices of packs ever surpass the value of their PSA 10 chase cards? You already do in some instances. There's no one answer. You know, for example, first edition base, I doubt you'll ever see a pack go above 40,000. You know, in the short term, right now, that's not a foreseeable reality. Uh, so it depends on the set. You know, if we look at sports, like the vintage stuff, like 79 OPG, packs are pretty valuable. They, they outpace majority of the cards in there. Uh, but they're not going to outpace Gretzky because it's very hard to grade. So it really depends on the sets. You know, it, it's there's no one answer. John Prendel asks, would you rather have a first edition stamp tattooed on your forehead for the rest of your life or give one of your Pikachu illustrators away for free? This is a dead serious question. <laughs> I definitely have to go with the first edition stamp. No shame here. Uh, that's the obvious answer. Uh, I'm, I support the first edition stamp to the point where 
it would go on the forehead before giving away the illustrator. So yeah, that's my absolute serious answer to that super serious question. Zach Eggers asks, what's up, Zach? Scott, my question is, why do you not have a collection throughout E4? I'd love to see your personal collection. I did, uh, since the start, the site began in 2010, I had a collection thread, but I kind of, I met a lot of my goals, a lot of reasons for why I didn't, didn't and don't share as much today. Uh, I don't like to share as much for a lot of reasons, uh, confidence, consumer confidence, um, you know, just a lot of personal reasons as well. So I think the main one is I met a lot of my goals and my perception of, you know, sharing that all the time has changed. Harrison asks, my question is, do you think the first edition Dark Charizard from Team Rocket will slowly gain more momentum as is the second first edition Charizard card ever printed in English? I think it's highly underrated, but what are your thoughts on it? I agree. I do think it's a little bit underrated. I think a more rational or objective take would be the boxes keep increasing. I think they're about $2,000 now, correct me if I'm wrong, give or take. So therefore, once that availability of the 10s uh, dissipates or shrinks significantly, you'll probably naturally see some type of movement. Uh, you know, one, again, it's all about that availability. Once that changes, then you'll start to see that movement occur. Uh, Bird Dose says, as a teacher in Germany, I see children talking about the Pokemon games in general while very little to none are collecting or playing with the real cards. It's not so much of a phenomenon anymore, but the kids are still, the cards are still selling well in stores for Pokemon in general. Do you think kids growing up with online games will spend their money mostly for games and online collectibles like skins and will they eventually return to the physical? Um, that, I mean, this could be its own video. This is a very, very solid topic to sink your teeth into. But what I'll say is that in the U.S., it's still very popular. Uh, my friends that teach talk about how they have to take away the cards. Kids are still bringing the cards to class. They still like the IP. And I think that's the main focus. As long as they enjoy Pokemon and the IP, that is the general takeaway. I mean, look at Ruby Sapphire. That was the lowest point in this hobby, objectively speaking. And look at the re-release. I mean, it did very well. So it's tough to get data from kids even for myself i bought like three base unlimited packs you're like oh this is just some kid buying the fad 90s stuff but you know internally it's something i really cared about i already liked so it's really hard to get a metric on that but i would say as long as the ip is doing well like you said they're still selling i think that's the the biggest boost of confidence you know that's that's the best metric to focus on illuminati asks how do you feel about pokemon charging 50 dollars for the dragon majesty majesty elite trainer box I mean, I'm not too cynical on it because I think they're trying to stabilize. Like, the, the background to that reasoning is after Crimson Invasion, a ton of businesses were upset because some of them lost half of their net worth. That's not an exaggeration. Because people were buying them, like, the previous sets, Guardians Rising, um, Ultra Sun and Moon, and it obviously wasn't as good. So, therefore, Pokemon had to restructure the distribution, or at least distributors had to play ball and stabilize. I think that's why you're seeing that price tag. Maybe it's a little bit of a high point. Maybe it'll settle down and fizzle down moving forward. But nonetheless, they're trying to stabilize right now. That's the reasoning behind that, that price hike. Uh, Hawkfish says, congratulations. How many cards do you tend to sell on average per month? I'm definitely more quality versus quantity. What I can say is my eBay page is only about 10% of my sales and even that I think might be a little bit generous. Majority of what I make is private. A majority of it is not through eBay. Uh, it's, it's specifically high-end cards and actual specifically rare cards. That's what I tend to deal in. That's my wheelhouse. But I'm a rare bird. I'm not the norm. Like most people are doing quantity, like higher and quantity. So that's what I'm in. It's more feast or famine for that, that, that type. And obviously, higher quantities, lower margins, and more activity. Nate asks, is it a bad idea removing PSA 6 through 8 cards from their cases and keeping them in a binder? They don't tend to sell as well graded that low unless they're high end, of course. Do you feel like the hobby is nearing its peak or has peaked? Okay. So as for the lower grades, that's something I do. It's something a lot of people do. PSA 5 to even, you know, 8, as you mentioned, perfect. You know, depending on the set, I would even say five to seven, you know, that's mainly what I do because you don't really need the back to be in good condition because you're not going to see it in the binder. So yeah, a lot of people do and have the same impression you just mentioned. As for the market peaking, it is at an all-time high. Every market's at all-time high. Stocks, real estate, you name it. Everything's very high right now. I wouldn't consider that a bubble. It's just high. I think that's there's a big difference between bubble and the market being high, which again, could be its own video. And lastly, crispy or chewy bacon? Is this like Rudy's floppy taco? Uh, Crispy for sure. I'll even go more specifically. I say that nice, big, fat, 
bit for the end. So there you go. Crispy with fat at the end. I'm very Brad. Pokemon PSA Brad. Here it comes. Something about first edition base. Do you think that the prices are more stable now for first edition PSA Watsy Hollows? I recently looked up some prices for the first time in a while, and it seems some are around the same, and some are also down a little bit from Pokemon Go a few years back. Or could it be that the populations are up and collectors fulfilled their needs with certain cards? Also, first edition or bust, I'm looking at you, Nintendo. Uh, I think you pretty much summarized it. You know, my, my impression is similar to what you said. I think when you had the Pokemon Go re-entry point, you had a lower supply, and a lot of people come in that needed to achieve and fulfill these goals. So naturally, what's that going to do? it's gonna push those prices up very quickly. So now that there are a lot, there's a lot more supply out there and more of those goals are fulfilled by more people, uh, you, you will see it settle out. And I would say around January, February, earlier in the year, it was a little bit lower and now it's more stabilized. And as long as supply sustains with that much demand, I think prices will be what they are. So I think that's what we're experiencing. We're experiencing a stabilization right now. Big Birdie asks, Hey Scott, I have a legendary reverse holo charge on PSA 9. Print line air seemed to have stopped it from hitting a 10. I was wondering if you see this card in the set growing in popularity for years to come. I'll be honest, legendary collection is a huge enigma for me. Uh, for, for about the first 10 years when I got back into it, it was basically base set 2. You know, people didn't care about it. And then within the past few years, social media really boosted it. It's really grown in popularity. So... I don't see it moving and having that meteoric rise that it did because it was pretty much flatlined and then it had that explosivity. So I really don't know. I'll be honest. It's an enigma. I don't understand Legendary Collection and I'm, and I'm straight up about it. So that's that's my general take on it. I just wouldn't expect another meteoric rise. Good thing I took a drink for this one. PFM asks, what is the angle between the hour hand and the minute hand on a clock when the time is 3.15? Like... But these memes are so deep, I don't even know what's happening. But if this is the Gem Mint Pokemon question, I did see that. And I think Hypernova says 7.5. So I'm going to be honest and just copy Hypernova's work and say 7.5. Uh, but yeah, I have, no, I have no idea. And I don't know why Zach, they'd ask that question in an interview. It's, I don't know what they gained from that. So uh, Oswoop asks, do you reckon Pokemon or maybe PSA will do something special for the 20th Watsi Pokemon anniversary next February? I don't think so. I think it's because Watsi doesn't own Pokemon anymore. It'll be hard. I hope they do do something. You know, that'd be great. But I just wouldn't hold my breath because, you know, the rights have changed. But we'll see. I think the Japanese side, I'd expect more than I would on the English. Next question. What do you think of the new Transformers TCG made by Watsi? I didn't even know it existed, so that's what I think of it. Uh, Mucho to the point asks, do you think the BGS 10 or Becca grading is now better given that they're actually shown the weaknesses of the cards? Starting to feel like PSA purposely waters down card grades for the sake of saturation. Um, I'll just go ahead and bury that conspiracy, drop it where it needs to go. PSA couldn't care less about Pokemon. They do not even have the proper expertise to handle everything that is Pokemon, so there's no way they're conspiratorially, conspiratorially looking at Pokemon in that way. It's not something that is even on their radar. It's super low end, 90% of the stuff that goes to PSA is in bulk. So no, they're not purposely doing whatever to saturate grades. Uh, BGS is only nine to 10 in Pokemon. I would even I would even extrapolate for that for BGS in general. People really only care about nine to 10 in BGS. That's where the premium lies. It doesn't really lie in the lower stuff, anything under nine really. You know, if you go to Magic or Sports, there's not much of a difference there in the premium until you get to the nine and 10. So that's just my general overview. Holy wall of text. Look at this, look at this question. <laughs> there's, there are more words here than there are Pokemon. So I'm just gonna go through the first point and answer that. Uh, thank you for making your videos. Uh, my goal, I would like to possess a complete PSD 10 unlimited base set. Question, what is the highest ROI avenue? Okay, we're going to stop it right there. This is a great time to plug Patreon. If you want this wall of text answered and to give you my opinion, I again, just take the time to read this and then properly responding. Time is money, so that's why I have the Patreon set up. So if you want that critical answer, I have that Patreon uh, set up for that. But in general, based on limited, is not going to give you high ROI. Jason Leg asks, do you ever get time to sit down and enjoy your collection? If so, what do you find yourself looking through? Very good question. Yes, I do. 
Binders is what comes to mind. That's majority what I look through most bang for your buck. To see everything together, I think, does something as well. Also, I think this needs to be stated a little bit more, is that genuine interest is why this all exists. So I would recommend doing this for, even if you're all here for the money and you want to make money, you got to have that interest. And I think you learn a lot from that interest. You know, even me looking at these binders, I'm like, oh, wow, I really like this artist. And you start to see that artist emerge. A lot of people are collecting certain illustrators now and certain artists. And that's very economical. There's, that might be a new opportunity. So that's a great example of how something, you know, a new opportunity might arise just from genuinely looking at the cards and appreciating the art. Brandon asks, do you think it is worth it to get all rare, hollow, and better cards graded? I know they don't sell well, but do you think it's worth the investment to grade? Again, this is kind of a Patreon question. I, I need to know what set you're talking about, the condition of the grade, your, your income, things like that. So yeah, in general, it's unanswerable. Uh, Chun asks, what is your take on the new back trophies, for example, like Champions League, Warner Platinum? They might not have the same demand as the old back trophies, but they still are very rare. I do agree that rarity is the ultimate investment vehicle. However, those new backs, I don't see much long-term demand, honestly. I think you're at, a, you're at a price point with those where if it starts to hit five figures, the English Peak is the, the better option. You know, it's like you can get a freaking unique card that has six copies awarded to the players it's, that's actually rare or unique art. So it is cost of capital for me. I mean, I, I don't doubt that they will incrementally grow. I just don't see the same demand for them. And then once you hit that cost of capital, I see people going in another direction. Aaron Nowak asks, are near mint to mint unlimited base cards worth buying for collection purposes and possibly as an investment considering the low price point compared to first edition shallow, similar to MTG unlimited revised versus alpha beta? Yeah, that's, that is a good point. I've actually talked about that in one of the few magic to Pokemon videos I've made is that it is unlimited is like unlimited and magic first editions like alpha shareless is like beta. But yeah, I mean, in general, you probably heard me already say this like two or three times in the video. Unlimited base is still available today. It's still affordable. I wouldn't hold your breath. Um, as far as like worth buying for your collection purposes, that's up to you. You know, again, you got to figure out that genuine thing, figure out what you want, chase those goals. That's the best advice I can give. Base set asks, what do you think about the old Japanese cards like Cardass, Top Sun, and Meiji? Meiji? I'm not pronouncing that right. But at the end of the day, I think they are niche. I, I have some of them. Like I have the, I really like the 1997, the Cardass set with Sugimori artwork, the original Sugimori artwork. But they're always going to be niche, but there is something there if you appreciate the art. Next question, what's your favorite non hollow card from a set and why? Very good question. Um, I'm just going to say Southern Island. Those Southern Island non hollow cards, I don't even care if they're hollow or not. They're just, that artwork is just so quality. Vending series is, is all not hollow. Quality artwork. So that'd, that'd probably be my answer. Uh, next question, what are the top sets to prioritize as a Pokemon collector? I want to click Japanese promos or what should I be prioritizing within a recent range uh if you're asking what's gonna hold its value patreon uh but in general japanese promos are severely underrated so i just mentioned vending that's a great example you get a lot of bang for your buck you get a lot of unique artwork that wasn't released in english very affordable alkin asks what do you think of the values of gym set how graphics do you think they will ever go up in price for psa 10 <laughs> these predict the future questions man uh I no one knows. No one knows what the go up in price. That's, that's all I'm gonna say. Thunder Moo says, "Would Pokemon still be a game today if Wizards had kept the rights to produce TCG?" Very good question. I don't think it would be as successful as it is now. I talked about before how Nindo, Nintendo is the necessary other. It preserved the Wizards of the Coast era. It gives Wizards of the Coast era the allure that it has now. It makes it more historical. You know that the necessary other is like the iceberg and Titanic. The Iceberg of Titanic was necessary to solidify that love story in the movie of Titanic. Because otherwise, if they survived, who knows what would have happened. Would the poor guy with this extremely wealthy girl from completely different backgrounds made it and been in love forever? That's what we like to think. But that necessary of the iceberg just solidifies that what-if moment. And I think that is necessary for the value of WotC. So if WotC would still do it today, I don't think it had the same allure. Honestly, I don't think it would. I think we romanticize it because, again, that necessary transition into Nintendo. Penguin KN asks, hey Scott, I love your videos. I'm a Patreon as well. Really appreciate that support. Uh, keep up the good work. I'm so grateful. Oh, that's part of the previous sentence. 
table right now and reading. Uh, regarding <laughs> regarding cards like Sun and Moon Secret Rares that aren't playable at all and are relatively cheap, like around five dollars, would the price drop that much more when they're rotated out? Very good. Uh, like Secret Rares, they are still hard to pull from packs. Just curious what you think and if you've seen a pattern before with these kind of cards. That's a very good question, especially at that cost at five dollars. I mean, there's a saying that I forget what it is in marketing or in business where if it's a cost of lipstick, it'll just sell forever. You know, something along those lines. And five dollars is that price point. Five dollars hits everybody. That hits even kids. So, yeah, that's hard to imagine that it would drop much more from that. That I'd have to. I really have to look into that. I really have to look into the numbers of secret rares because there's a potential there. Um, so yeah, I, in general, I don't know because that's that's uncharted territory. We haven't experienced that cycle out yet for this era. But at that price point, I would imagine there is opportunity for sure. Next question, would you sell your sealed collection one day? Also, would you sell any of your sealed booster packs? If so, I'd like to know. Uh, I'm not actively selling any of the vintage product that I have. Who knows? You know, I, life happens, things happen. I can never just say 100% no. Um, the ultimate truth to collecting is it's a time game. You don't live forever. So, But right now, no. The answer is no, I'm not selling any of that. Halo my e Halo my ego. <laughs> That's a good name. Asks, what is your favorite type of Pokemon in terms of element, fire, water, grass, etc.? Good question. I would say Psychic for sure. Psychic's gonna be my number one all day because of Mewtwo. Blaze through Pokemon Stadium, red and blue. So yeah, Psychic. And also to nerd out a little bit, I think Psychic's like something humans can attain. You know, if you become more intelligent, you're not psychic, obviously, but you're flirting with a little bit, so I can never breathe fire. Okay, I can't spit that high fire yet. Me Machine asks, opinion on those sweet Japanese specialty boxes, should they be released in English? Uh, these will never be released in English for a number of reasons. Uh, English is on the slow track. Japan is not. Japan is the cutting edge right now for everything exclusive and collectible. So it, it just simply won't happen for a number of reasons. So, you know, should it happen... It just won't, so I can't get past that to get into the hypothetical. But yeah, these will remain Japanese exclusive because they have so many more outlets and infrastructure and inertia of doing this since 1996. So, Ilker asks, What's up, Ilker? Glad you're still watching. You've been here since the beginning. Uh, hey, Scott, I've noticed in the SMR magazine that prices for Recession Base haven't moved much despite the card selling for record prices. It seems PSA is pretty conservative. What when providing new prices, do you have a standard whereas they only update limited times per year? Thanks again for the insight. Yeah, they, they do not update their price guides after the initial release. So those prices are literally 2016. So if you want to see in a time capsule what they were selling for 2016, there you go. They have not updated them since then. I will know firsthand when they do uh, because I work closely with them in relation to that. Uh, but they, they try to basically get multiple they have a lot of data they get like their their pop report price algorithm they get a lot of data the problem is they don't have the time to update it so yeah it just simply wasn't updated and i've, I've tried to push it to them but they, they just have so much stuff on their player right now maybe when that fizzles down or settles down maybe then they'll, they'll prioritize it bj asks is selling all my collection to buy one expensive card worth it oh good god that's a trap uh it depends on the card, depends on your collection, depends on your life situation, depends on what you like. So, Patreon is all I can say for that. Uh, Vincent asks about the English legendary Gold Star Dogs. Interestingly enough, they're cats, uh, but we all call them dogs. Uh, but anyway, they are still selling on eBay, PSA 10 sets. Do you think it's because despite the whole fiasco with the Netherlands seller, they are still worth that much? Or is it because they just don't know about the situation? You see the Japanese Gold Star Dogs quickly spiking in price. When more people catch on the japanese have always been more rare and scarce obviously because the gold star dog cat cat dogs are the least rare gold star out there because a good chunk of them were never released properly through packs so with that said just be bearish for them forever you know just be bearish on the cat dogs that's what i always tell people and yeah the price can incre incrementally grow but it's not obviously never going to explode like rayquaza or the king the king dinglings in the gold star world Andy asks, is it possible to make a rough estimate of the number of, say, base first edition Charizards that were printed? Uh, the pop report is going to be your best metric. There's never going to be, at least, unless someone can find that Watsy employee who knows 
and can get them to put it in writing, which this is probably never going to happen. But we'll, we'll never have the luxury of what Magic does with Legends, Antiquities, Arabian Nights, Alpha, whatever, where they have the actual print run. We'll never have that in Pokemon, but the pop report will be your best general metric. That's all. Gary asks, is Gary really as handsome in, in person? Is you, did your wife ask this question? I know you both watch the channel. You can't even say no to this. What am I going to do? Say no? I'm going to say no to this? So yeah. Yeah, Gary. You definitely, definitely uh, more handsome. Especially with the hockey hair flow. You got to keep that going. CD asks, what's up, CD? Uh, Cynthia or Cyrus? Por que no los dos? Why not both? Um... Next question, is it time to cash out yet? I don't know if that's serious, but I don't know. That's, that's, that's something you got to figure out uh, for yourself. I don't know what you have. If it's basic canopy, I'd hold on. Next question, favorite canopy card? First edition Shadowless canopy for sure. Across First edition canopy is actually difficult to grade. Like in the context of common cards, you have like the lower tier. Like I don't want to put out the lower tier, but we all know like let's say Pidgey or something like that is a lower tier common card where Caterpie is like on the upper end of the common card. So it's actually difficult to grade. So yeah, first edition based Caterpie. Steffi Chan is like, this is the Discord lineup right here. Steffi Chan asks, should I invest in Dragon, Majesty, Magikarps, hashtag Magikarp Army? I mean, yes. For, for meme's sake, yes. Go ahead and meme it up and make it a thing. Uh, Pull Fonts asks, I want to know how many Japanese champion leagues are awarded to champions because I search a little. It looks like three for every year. Thanks, Pratt. Um, th uh, this is a tough question. I was just talking to a good friend in Japan about that new, what is it, Champions Festival, that new card that just came out that they're they're awarding. And they're like, maybe 800 copies, maybe 1,000, maybe 1,200 there's just no one answer. The problem is, is that we have an issue with intended distribution and actual distribution, and we're finding out retroactively, like before we thought some of these cards had like 9 or 17 or 27 copies, and that keeps doubling because we start to realize, oh, there was another tournament, there was another age group. So at the end of the day, all we have is intended distribution, and even that, I don't know to answer your question, unfortunately. And even when you really get down into it with the Japanese, they have incongruent answers so it's really hard to figure out what the hell is going on now with these new tournaments because there's so many people involved and even the staff even on the for example on the english side where i could talk to them in the same language even they don't know so it's very difficult to get exact numbers on everything you boo ask i'm boring to see some slaves come to me and ask for expensive cards they cannot afford my question is simple <laughs> I'd share this question is not going to be simple. Fair warning, this is probably going to be explicit. Uh, this is Pilu. I'm trying not to be triggered reading this. Uh, do slaves have to switch to some collection like Force of Will or Funko Pops or things like that? Thanks for your advice. Also, stop shaving your face and be a man for once. Thanks. Oh my god. So for those who don't know, Pilu is someone who is a trash-talking meme machine. I don't think they're serious. I hope to God they aren't serious, but and what was this question anyway? What was this about? I'm glad you watched channel people. Thank you. I'll, I'll try and think next time when I'm sitting down and writing down my content and be like, you know what? Hang on. There's this person who we think is a girl in uh, France that likes to see us in Pratt with a little bit of a beard. I'll start to make that my top priority now instead of producing content. So next question, genuine question, how do you support yourself and this incredible yet expensive hobby? Do you rely on the YouTube channel and eBay alone? Also, is it possible for a red cheek based on Pikachu to not be shadowless? Uh, to answer the red cheek, absolutely not. It's going to be shadowless across the board. If you see one that isn't shadowless, it is fake. As for supporting myself, um, I, I'm not as transparent as someone like Rudy for a lot of reasons. Uh, Rudy's in a different position than me. I know a lot, of, I get this question a lot and it's usually in contrast to someone like Rudy. So what I can say is that, like I said earlier, my eBay page is maybe 10% of my sales that I have in a year. Majority of it's private. And in general, I would say I'm a business owner, investor and other things. So there you go. That, that's what I'd say. I'm not relying on YouTube whatsoever. What I will say about YouTube is very fun, but as far as money is concerned, it's definitely not a money maker. I would say I'm just trying to keep it in a place where the time I put in it and the effort I put in that takes away from the things that do make money uh, is is a break even. But it's definitely not again someone like Rudy who's who's big time. You know he's 
he's he's much more attractive in his uh his entertainment. He's much more entertaining. So there you go. That's the answer I would have. Uh, CP Customs asks, Hey Scott, I enjoy your channel and the effort you put in for the community. I really appreciate that. So thank you. Have you heard anything about the reprinting of Ultra Prism? If you haven't, would you think that there would be a point that Pokemon would just decide to not reprint because so many sets have already released since Ultra Prism? Thanks. Keep up the good work. As I mentioned before, Modern is already printed in such a large quantity. Uh, and to tie in some of the other questions that are related to this one, they are trying to stabilize it a little bit. But keep in mind, that's in the context of Modern. There are so many people, even when I talk, all the things I've talked about so far in this video, tying in the Japanese tournaments, how we're trying to figure out what's going on. Why we can't is because there's so many people. I just sold 30 boxes of Japanese product, Modern product, which is very rare. I don't sell Japanese Modern product that, at that quantity that fast. And that's because there's a shortage right now because of the Red's Pikachu. So all of this goes into that general nucleus of the market is so big, it's a mainstream market right now as of making this. So therefore, there's going to be a ton of product printed. So with that, combined with the retroactive reprint of Roaring Skies, Ancient Origins, Primal Clash, I just wouldn't hold your breath on anything modern being truly allocated. And I have to say that over and over again, people are probably tired of hearing it, but there you go. I just don't, I would not hold my breath that it's going to, that, that, that impression's not going to change. That pattern's not going to change. Mega Full Art Charizard has almost 2,000 PSA 10 examples as I'm making this video, and it's two years old. So there you go. Just piled it on that I, I just don't think it's going to happen. Jennifer A. Hey, Jennifer. I'm glad you're still watching as well. One of the OGs. Uh, is it possible to, is it possible that one day to see your sealed booster packs? I love those sort of videos. Also, why is the Lucky Saiyan Promo 41 card gone up in price? Uh, to answer the first part of that question, I don't really show a lot of my sealed products for a number of reasons. Um, I'll be transparent a little bit and say that I do keep a lot of my more valuable stuff away from the location where I make my videos and where I sleep at night. So that's one main reason. Uh, there's stuff in multiple locations, multiple states. So that's a big reason why. And also, I don't really know what it would do to drag in this. You know, it's it's easier for me to take, like, let's say, a box of graded cards with me. Because I can get, like, 20 cards in there. Where, you know, a booster box is even bigger than that. So it's just a mixture of space and priority. And, I, I you know, I don't have much to talk about just showing the box. Also, as far as the Lucky Stadium is concerned, the Black Star, why it's gone up in price? Uh, because people are simply sleeping on rarity. Uh, there's a pro Patreon tip I'll give you get everyone for free. People are sleeping on rarity right now. That's what I'm going after in a high market. It's all about rarity because it has the least risk of saturation. So whenever there's a high market, people tend to move their stuff into bonds and things like that. In general, people are just sleeping on rarity right now. You heard it here first. In the next five years, that's going to be uh, the nucleus of what to buy that won't plummet moving forward. Next question, what is your favorite or dream car? I'll be real with you. I'm not big into cars. I think supercars are retarded. I, I don't care how ridiculous that sounds or how... If, if you're into cars, that's great. You're a genuine, whatever, motorhead or whatever. But I think the majority of people I see that buy like expensive cars, first of all, they can't afford it. And second of all, it's not an investment. So for me, I don't do enough driving to justify that. But, you know, if, if I, I could afford those supercars and I just don't because it's just a money pit... And again, I just don't appreciate it. No offense to people who do, but that's that's just where I am on it because I, it's just one of those things that there's always another one. There's always a better one. There's always a modified one. There's just so many of them out there that it's hard for me to really to really get into it. But it may, maybe a Tesla, that's something I've been kicking around. Maybe a Tesla. Uh, when I need to buy another car, maybe, maybe that's what I'll do. So there you go. And with a little optimism there mixed in with that cynicism. Jay McDonald asks, I'm just getting back into collecting after not doing so for 20 years since I was since I was a teen. What tips can you give me? Thanks. Number one thing I can tell you, Jay, collect what you like. That's it. There's too many people saying the buzzword investment right now. And the number one thing is collecting what you like. And, and like I said earlier in that comment about rarity, rarity is going to be the thing that has the least risk of saturation. That's it. Does it mean it's going to grow as much as Charizard first edition base? Who knows? Probably not. But at the end of the day, it has the least risk of saturation. So let's say, hypothetically, there were a recession. What's going to go down in price? Probably a mid-tier car that's about 100 bucks that thousands of people have. Because that's a higher probability of people dumping that to get that quick cash. Or something like your Pikachu Illustrator or your Charizard First Base or First Edition Base Box. That has a much lower risk of being saturated for one main reason. There's a lot less of them out there. So... That's the practical side of it, but I can't emphasize enough. Just do what you enjoy. That is what this market is created on. 
genuine interest. That's what all hobbies are created on is genuine interest. So just do that. That's how I started. That's how I sustain. That's how I survive and thrive. Lucid Enigma asks, is persistence towards one girl a lost art in the dating world? I don't even know. I don't even, I don't even know what that means. Sure. Uh, Clager asks, hey, Scott, thanks for all the great content. I've always wondered, do you have a day job or is it just, just cards for you? As I said earlier, um, what I can say is... It, Majority of the stuff's private. Majority of the stuff is some of it's Pokemon, some of it's other investments and things like that. Uh, the, the key thing I'll tell you is I, I'm just an entrepreneur in general. Very minimal lifestyle. It's a video I'll probably make here in the near future. But yeah, minimal lifestyle, very prudent, very frugal from a very young age. And that, that's pretty much who I am in general and hopefully will be moving on. Bear any like identity crisis. But yeah, that's the core, the core of it. No, I do, I do not work for someone. I will never work for someone. Uh, Steven asks, what do you think about the potential for modern cards such as the new Shinies, Rainbow Rares? In general, I've mentioned this before already. It's just something that is printed into oblivion. I don't see much hope long term. A little bit of opportunity, but have fun with it. Uh, next question, where's Gem Mint Pokemon? He's busy, I guess. Uh, he's in school right now doing a lot, trying to get a job. But I talk to him pretty regularly, at least once a week. You can catch him on Discord now and again. We have a good time hanging out there. Next question, do you think the gold stars will drop in price? I'm referring to the bubble you mentioned in previous videos. Keep up the good work. I, I don't see any indicator there's going to be a huge fall off. Some of the higher end cards are acting speculative because people are trying to shill up their, their purchase price instead of just letting, letting it organically you know, dip a little bit and then, and then move up down the road. But in general, the, the gold star bubble is not happening like it was in 2013, 14. There's always speculation with gold stars because a lot of it's driven by speculation of social media. I don't see a huge tectonic drop, uh, but you know, could be wrong. I'd, I'd pleasantly be pleasantly surprised if I was wrong because I'd be ready to buy some of them, but I just don't see any indicator for that to happen. Okay, uh, in previous videos, you have talked about massive deals going on behind the scenes. Any more disclose? At the moment, no. Uh, there is one I might disclose or I might have to disclose is a better way to say it. I usually don't like to share this stuff for a lot of reasons. Uh, there's a lot of butt hurt in Pokemon when this happens. I'm tired of dealing with it, so that's why I just, I dial it down. But there is one deal that did occur, it's massive. Uh, the buyer does want me to disclose at some point. I don't know if that'll happen. So yeah, that's pretty much all I can say. Uh, Gus asks, does raffling things on Instagram damage the hobby? Do you feel like it helps inflate the price of boxes and sealed product? Yeah, I do think it does expedite the process. A little bit I don't like raffles I think they are bad for the hobby um, I think they're relegated mostly to lower tier buyers like a low resource buyer and when you get into that the thing you get into are kids and that's my number one pet peeve with the fake cards and the raffles is they are literally targeting kids like there's a guy on E4 who posted about how he talked about some company this is an actual business in California and I get it I know it's hard to survive as a brick-and-mortar I get that but they were running raffles and he was literally bidding against a 13 year old. It's like, you're literally bidding against children. To me, that's just not on, you know, that that's not a good thing. So I don't know the ultimate effect of it. I do think it does definitely decrease the availability of seal product and hyperactive have a, have an effect on the price of seal product uh, because it, it is the main name of the game it is sealed booster packs and boxes. Okay, uh, what's your opinion on the Japanese exclusive Pokemon vs. set? It's underrated. Short and sweet. James Lee, hey Scott, would you rather prefer to have a Metapod or Kakuna keep up the great work? Uh, Metapod, I guess. Green's my favorite color, so there you go. Adrian Boss asks, what is your opinion on sets heavily filled with reprint art? Do you think it's a good idea or no? I think it's good to pepper it in there. I think Pokemon's actually been doing pretty well. Like, Evolutions was explosive. Evolutions alone got a ton of people back into the game. I think the Champion Road, where they did the uh, the Neo era, I think it's good to pepper it in there now and again. I don't think it affects the original, if that's what you mean. Uh, reprints, are like, they have a half-life to me. They're like a clone. They have a half-life. They're not going to sustain like the original. Look at Evolution Charizard. What has First Edition Charizard done since Evolution Charizard? It's It's gone up, you know. So it, it doesn't have an effect on the original. If anything, it has a uh, chance that it'll bring people back to the original. Okay, next question from Let's Go. Hey, Scott, congrats on 5K. Love your channel. Really appreciate it. Uh, here's my question. 
what do you do with all your ungraded, unlimited Watsy bulk? Okay. I have a very large amount of Watsy unlimited commons on commons, but I don't have the rares and hollows in the same stock to be put together for a full set. Are partially complete sets or complete uncommon common sets regularly purchased? I, I would say in general, putting them together in some like common to uncommon uh, lot is probably going to do better than individually. I mean, you're, you're asking a question that there just simply isn't a market yet to piece that stuff out. You know, when you get into especially unlimited, even for Watsy, I have a lot of it myself and I honestly just don't know. But I, I would say if I were to sell that to take the time and put that together and put it up on eBay, I would go the, the route of putting it in a lot like you mentioned. You know, do the commons, uncommons. They're not going to be liquid. They're going to take time. They're going to take patience, but that's probably the best maneuver. Jim Michaels asks, I have a Charizard Grey collection that I want to sell. I have used eBay, but would you prefer face-to-face -face or selling like on E4? What would you suggest? Well, there's no selling on E4. Face-to-face, -face, I mean, usually that's just the meetup part of the deal to finalize and, and transact. Uh, eBay is going to be your best bet. The market's very high right now. There's, there's a decent amount of Charizard stuff available. So like I said to the person with the bulk, it'll take time. Charizard is a little bit more liquid, but yeah, eBay is going to be your main thing. The one thing I will give you here, actually it's a good uh, teaching point to say, if you want to sell it all to like a store, you're probably going to get 50% what you could on the open market because that store is going to buy all your product and they're going to have to piece it out over a year's time, which is going to be time is money and work. So they're going to give you a lot less, but you don't have to do any work. Like I had a patron who, he was a doctor actually, a retired doctor, an older guy. No offense to that age range, Gary, I know you're listening. Uh, but he sold, he had a first edition box, jungle, base, fossil, the, the whole run, bought him at $100 a piece back in the day. The, you know, that dream scenario. And he came to me and I was like, you know, here are your options. You can put it up, wait, get that, like that 40 to 50K price tier, or you have all these, these businesses who will buy it, I think 35 in hand at the time. And tomorrow, the next day, he's like, you know what? Don't want to worry about it. Just want to get the bird in the hand and did. He went from $100, $35,000. And that business can, maybe they can make 10000 10, off of that. Have, everyone's happy. So there you go. I mean, that's, it really depends on your margins. It really depends on what you want to do, but hopefully that, that story helps you. Lost My Sauce says, what's your educational background? I love your business and economical take on your videos. A very good question. I primarily based in philosophy. That's my main background. Um, as far as education concerns, this is going to be philosophical in itself. My current state of mind in education is, I, I used to think like college universities are like, you know, the, this elite thing you get into and you come out and it's like, you know, the, this binary black and white scenario. I don't think that anymore. Um, I, th I think there is value to education, no doubt. It's a key to everything. But after graduating with my undergraduate degree in philosophy, I just, uh, that level of engagement that I had in business and economics from like what I do, you know, it just, you, you can't teach that. Like I have a friend who's, who was doing his MBA years ago and we were talking and he's like, yeah, man, like you just can't teach what you're going through. Like they try to bring in people to make it stick. But you know, at the end of the day, I'm just saying this for the people out there who don't have that traditional education. I'm not that. I was someone who I didn't know what I wanted to do and I fell into philosophy and then I got into this practical side of business and finance because a lot of it translates. It's just logic applied to the category of finance and business and that's how it all worked out. So yeah, I mean, that's my background and it's non-traditional. I think it's just yet another American tale of someone just paving their own way. So there you go. Jan Hendrik asks, what's up, Jan Hendrik? Hey, Scott, how many Illustrated Pikachus do you own at the moment? And do you regret selling those a while back around 50 to 60 K given they increase the market value? I don't want to say publicly how many I own, um, but what I will say is that no, I'm not, I don't regret doing those sales because I think they're necessary. Because I think a lot of people, for example, refer to the Heritage one, which I wasn't completely happy with Her with Heritage for a number of reasons. The, the unfortunate immature side of the hobby that, that basically tried to tarnish that that auction as well as these high-end auction houses are sleeping heavily on Pokemon. But at the end of the day, that, that auction, the publicity from it, solidified that in a more mainstream way. So that's that's the optimistic view on it. That That's what I focus on at the end of the day. So yeah, sure, I can make more money on them today, uh, but I'm glad they occurred because it really solidified that as like a, as a benchmark. And, you know, and it showed, you know, this is something that when an auction was a historical moment. So th there's like a more philosophical, I guess, perspective to it. Carlo asks, have you ever gotten burnout because the last couple months I have been really burnt out and I wanna 
get a Dragon Majesty box, but I just can't bring myself to buy them. Yeah, I mean, everyone goes through cycles in life in general, whether it's collecting, hobbies, anything you enjoy. Anything you do in general, you're going to go through a cycle. There's no one state of mind that you're constantly in. So, so yeah, I, I've been down that road. It's, it's natural for collectors. Um, I'm very used to it now. I'm very used to the cycle. And the number one thing I can tell you is binders. Binders are what I go to. Bind, when I don't know what I want to do, I just start another binder collection. You know, I have like probably three full first edition base sets or four full first edition base sets ungraded that I have organized in different binders because I just love it so much. I love the history of it. I love the artwork. I, you know, just looking at it, I'll always look at that like shadowless design and it's always going to hit this nostalgic like integral part of who I am. So binders is what I do when I'm feeling burnt out and it just rejuvenates the uh, collecting spirit. Pokey Juice asks... Does the same card from the same grade have a different value based on the age or style PSA case? And do you prefer the new or old? Very good question, Pokey Juice. Um, for me, I do value the newer cases. I actually have some sitting right here I need to recase. Like this guy has a friggin' crack in the side of it. Good card with a good grade, but I do like this case where it's thicker, the newer ones. Uh, even the newest ones, they're a little bit, I actually have one right here. The newer ones that kind of feel a little sharp. I don't know if anyone else felt that as well. A little bit sharp on the sides. I think those and the previous models are the best as in regards to like functionality. But I have plenty of old... Like some of my trophy cards are in the old case with the old label. So, I mean, I'm not one of those people who's going to break a deal because of the case. I know some people do. I personally wouldn't recommend that. You know, if it's a card you really want, just get it. It's not the seller or owner's fault that's in a case you don't like. And you can always just recase it if you like the newer one for like whatever the low cost is. So... So yeah, that, that's my take on it. I'm not too picky, but if I had to choose, it, it, it would definitely be the newer design. Sean B asks, Scott, my question is, do you play Pokemon Go? If, if so, can I have your friend number to add you? Also, what is your main online source of buying ungraded and graded cards? Uh, yeah, sure, just hit me up on E4. I'm giving my friend code, and I do play Pokemon Go. I try to be consistent with it. Uh, and for ungraded and graded cards, I don't have one source. Talked about this recently in that secret Japanese website video the whole point of that is there is no one if you had to say one source it's just ebay like ebay is the like conglomerate literally and figuratively it's it, it, like bought out all these other little marketplaces back in the day it's the go-to in this hobby it's the open market but yeah just buy from ebay yahoo japan and privately that's it uh, a lot of this is just a lot of very exceptional scenarios a lot of hard work and planning over time a little bit of luck a little bit of timing so there, there is no one one oasis Next question, getting, getting close to the end here. Uh, hi, Scott. I've been subscribed to you for a while, and I always watch your videos, and they are damn good with the top class information. Appreciate that. A uh, couple questions. There is quite a large difference between PSA 9 and 10 WotC cards in general. Do you think that gap will tighten up in time, or will there always be a vast difference between the prices? It depends on the card. I was just talking about this in, in a patron call the other day. It really depends on the card. I think there's a lot of values in the nines for anyone who watches those Patreon exclusive videos. That's probably one of the most recurrent themes I have is the nines do have a lot of value. Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. So if you're talking like first edition based Charizard, yeah, you're talking like $20,000 in difference in price there. So is it worth it to have that one less speck of whitening for 20 grand? That's up to you. That's up to you and your goals. But it really depends on the cards. You know, it really depends on the era. I will say 9 and 10s have the biggest gap in that there is no 0.5 qualifier. For 8, there is a 0.5. For 7 and so on, there is that 0.5. So you don't have that 9 to 10. So I think, you know, speaking philosophically here, there is more of a range in 9 to 10. You know, there's I have some super strong 9s that will never get a 10. They are so strong, but they will never be a 10 because there is that no middle ground of 9.5. They would be a 9.5 if it existed. So maybe that's part of the, part of the reason there for, for the prices. Okay, next question, last four here. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Do you own any? If not, why? Also thoughts on the secret rare energies. I've talked a little bit about secret rares, but to answer your question on Bitcoin, sorry, crypto guys, I'm not big into it because I have better vehicles. I have better investment vehicles. It's just something I don't have the time to monitor. I think that's really what it comes down to. For crypto, I feel like you gotta be on it all the time. It's like a day, I feel like crypto is just day trading that's the whole market is just day trading. Like you got to be on top of the stuff nonstop. I don't have the time to do that. So that's why I don't dabble in it. It's that simple. So I would say these like 
compounded crypto, your buddy has a crypto, this, this Twitch guy has a crypto, that stuff I would never recommend touching. I think it's super saturated, but something like Bitcoin that's established, I just simply don't have the time, like I said, to monitor it. Congrats on 5K. Here's my question. Do you have a personal favorite Pokemon that you love to collect? And I, oh, I personally collect Eevee and Dragonite, but go for what I see and like to do. That, that's what I did as well when I started. I went for, I tried to do the original Kanto era. Then I tried to go for the Wizards of the Coast sets. I did every Blastoise card, every Mewtwo card that was released at the time, because Blastoise and Mewtwo are what saved me back in the day, Pokemon Blue and Pokemon Yellow. So, yeah, that's, I would say Blastoise and Mewtwo are what I go for. I did Mew as well, actually. There you go, Skin. She had some competition back then. I stopped probably like 2008 around there. Uh, but I had everything up until about 2008 for those, for those three. Next question, I need some advice. I have a complete base set with mediocre quality cards. Should I grade the hollows or keep them in complete binder set? If it's mediocre quality, I don't know what that is, your definition of that, but I would say if it's base and limited, not in nine to 10 condition, yeah, keep it in a binder. Last but not least, final question of the Q&A. White Cody asks, do you think the new Mega Charizard Arena box will hurt the flash fire booster boxes? Uh, potentially, I, I, don't, I don't think so because I think the booster box in general is its own entity. It's, an, it's its own vehicle, it's its own piece, it's its own collectible. So I did, I'll be transparent, I did sell some of my Flash Fire stock because I had a lot of it. And I was like, you know what, I'll let some of these boxes go. They've appreciated for my initial cost. I don't see it being a huge threat, just like with the reprint thing. Again, reprints are like clones, they have half-lifes. I don't see a lot of people buying the Charizards because of playability. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think a lot of people buy it because of collectability. But again, more specifically, I think people just collect sealed product as its own thing. Like that box back there, that's its own identity. That's a very strong identity. Obviously, first edition base is, is the top of the mountain as far as sealed product is concerned. But that has its own identity separate from the actual card. So yes, they're similar. Yes, it's the same set. Yes, they share certain things. But I would say because Flash Fire is Flash Fire, it has its own identity as a box. I don't see it being dramatically affected. But again, that's just my opinion. We'll see what happens. So there you go, guys. This was fun. I tried to answer everything. Sorry if I missed your question. I tried to combine them and do the best to my ability. But thanks again for the 5K subscribers. It really means a lot. Thanks a ton to the Patreon subscribers. You're the literal figurative reason why I keep doing this channel. Like I said, it does detract from the things that make money. So it really fulfills that practical aspect and i'm just gonna keep on doing videos at least once a week and there you go guys it's everything i have hopefully this was entertaining and useful to you to to you until next time